So, what are you going to talk about? Can you do a quick introduction? Uh, a quick introduction would be, yeah, I'm going to be talking about static web apps in Azure and specifically using uh, Blazor and Azure Functions to start to build up your own presence online without relying too much on other networks. Wow, sounds great. Let's get started. The floor is Thank yours. You. Good luck. So, do we have a screen? Hey, I don't have to ask you guys if you can see my screen now. I can check myself. That's awesome. So, good evening, everybody. It really is so spectacular to be here today. I, I'm, I'm totally psyched seeing people again. It's awesome. So, sometime around the middle of last year, I saw a tweet come by my timeline, and it was talking about how if you're blogging and you're using somebody else's network, no matter how amazing that network is, then you're basically putting your time and effort and skills into building up that other network rather than your own. I thought, well, I use Dev.2 for my blogging because it's easy, it's nice and I can do everything in VS Code in Markdown and it all works beautifully, but I can see the point. So what can I do to move that into my own um, place? So I went out and I got myself a domain, or actually I got three because when did anybody ever stop at buying one domain? I got stacyclouds.com.dev and .net. And then I did absolutely nothing with it. And, well, aside from the whole buying a domain and using a domain being two different hobbies, the thing that stopped me was the elephant problem. I decided in my head that if I'm going to build my own place online, I'm not going to use a prepackaged blog application that I can quickly put together. I'm going to use it to expand my skills and try new things. And that means that I need to build it. And if my clicker works, which of course it's not going to because I've only tried it like four times this evening. Yeah, well, we'll do it the old fashioned way. Yeah, there we go. So if I'm going to build my own blog site, then I'm going to need to be able to display blog posts. I'm also going to need to edit those blog posts. I'm going to have to put some authentication and some authorization in there because I don't want other people editing my blog posts. It has to look absolutely awesome, obviously. And so many other things besides the elephant problem. I can't possibly do all of this because I'm already so busy. I don't have time to do this. Not only do I have to build it, I also then figure out how to host it. And that started to get better when I started to see static web apps in Azure last year. At the time, they were in preview. They were a little bit limited, but they were really awesome. Um, you can host your site, your static content. And I've had lots of interesting discussions over the last year about, is static content really static content if it does API calls and changes? So I'm going to say static files with an Azure API, Azure Function API, in order to get that data that I wanted. And then I saw Blazor 2, so I added this to the mix. And whilst I use Angular for the front end work in my day to day work in the office, I am kind of a C sharp developer by heart. And yeah, it'd be really cool to try and put everything back into one language again. And again, learn something new, see what I can do with it. And in doing this, I thought, well, I can do this one step at a time. I don't have to build everything. When you make a Blazor application, you get a scaffolded solution. It's not the most beautiful thing in the world, but it works. And I can build on top of that, and I can make it do things. And apparently, we're having really interesting issues now. I know that you can't see anything, because I can't see anything either. I hope that's not my laptop. We'll find out in a minute. Um, so I started to think how I could build my own site. And then, as I say, deploy it using those Azure static apps in order to get it out there. The great thing, come on, please work. I've got to do a demo in a minute. The great thing about using the static apps as well is um, 
It's all serverless. I don't know. There's always at least one server in serverless, but it's all serverless. You make one Azure resource, and in that you get your application, you get your Azure functions, you get authentication, you get a nice uh, proxying effect between the two so that your API and your website all sit on the same URL. This is going to get really cool in a minute. And it all works out of the box. So I started to put this together. My website is now live. It is a work in progress. It is going to be a work in progress for a while yet because I don't have the time to put into it that I would really like to. But it doesn't matter because with the way that I've built it, I can just put in a couple of hours here, a couple of hours there, and just add a little bit of functionality and move it along as I go using static web apps, using Blazor, using Azure functions to tell the world who I am. So who am I? I'm Stacy Cashmore. I'm Tech Explorer DevOps at Omniplan in Amsterdam. Is it on my end? Oh dear. Can we maybe stick that on there to hold it down? Is that going to help? Ah, but then I have an issue because if you do that, I'm not going to have internet because that's also my network connection. Now it's completely broken. <laughs> uh, I have a second one. Shall I get uh, my spare out? Should we turn it? Yep, fine. I've got yeah. USB on this side. Okay. Yep. Oh. <laughs> Welcome to the first in person talk in 18 months. Yeah, it doesn't happen online, right? Your computer never freezes. <laughs> Come on, do something. Yeah. Yeah, we're getting something, we're getting something. Ish. Oh, I can see something. Right, let me just make sure everything's on the right screen and then I will continue. Okay. Come on, do something. So, after that brief interlude, uh, yeah, I'm Stacey Cashmore. I'm Tech Explorer DevOps by Omniplan in Amsterdam. Uh, I was going to say in the Netherlands because I normally do this online. I guess you kind of guess that now. Um, I've been a developer since about 1995-ish, mid-1990s. And for the last year and a bit, I've been a Microsoft MVP in developer technologies, which I'm also really psyched about. Right, now we have a screen that hopefully works, and I guess I have a dongle that I'm throwing away when I get home. Um, let's see whether or not we can get the demo working for you, because that's the fun stuff, of course. So where's all my screens gone? There we go, there's one. And Visual Studio, because without that we don't get very far. And I think we're possibly good to go. Fingers crossed. So the first thing that we're going to be doing today is creating that Blazor application and that Azure function so that we can get our data out into the world. So we're going to... Yes, yes, bleep, bleep. We're going to be adding a Blazor WebAssembly app, and we're going to be calling that client. Now, it's I call things client and API because it just fits really easily in the static web app inside of Azure, but you can call it whatever you want. Then we are going to need to put it in the right place so that GitHub picks up what I want it to. Is it against the code of conduct to swear at the computer when it doesn't do what you want it to do? Right, here we go. So I'm going to be using .NET 5. I'm not going on to .NET 6 yet. Uh, it does kind of work with static web apps already, but I have had some interesting side effects, so I try not to use that too much right now. 
Uh, we're not going to be doing anything with the authentication or um, the progressive web apps because we're not using that. Uh, we are obviously not going to be hosting it inside of .NET because we want those static files that we can just serve directly from that static web app inside of Azure. Let's create that up, get it scaffolded. This takes about two seconds when you're not giving demo, obviously. Come on, little computer. So now we have the client, we're going to add the API. So we're just going to add a new project here, and that's going to be an Azure function. And we're just going to call that API. I'll show you why in a couple of minutes. And we want a HTTP trigger, which I believe, certainly in the preview, and I believe it still is in the GA, is the only functions that you can run inside of an Azure static web app. So here we have our um, scaffolded up application. Is that font size OK for the people at the back, or do you want me to zoom in? Awesome. Thank you. So I don't know if you've seen a scaffolded Blazor application before, but out of the box, you get three pages. You get a counter page, which just shows you that you can interact with buttons. You get a fetch data page, and this goes to the back end and gets some sample JSON that comes with it out of the box and shows you how you can put that on the screen. And of course, you get your index page to say hello. Well, the first thing I want to show you today is just getting this application running locally and then pushing it up into Azure and then we'll make it do some cool stuff. So what we're going to do, we're going to change this fetch data page. We're going to turn it from looking at that JSON data and we're actually going to go to an API inside of a function uh, and then get it deployed and show you a couple of different ways how you can run this locally. So in order to do that, first thing I'm going to do, because I absolutely hate having something in my app called function one, is I'm going to rename that to be weather forecast. Yeah, whatever. And then because you really don't want to watch me for the next 40 minutes just do lots of typos, I've got some code snippets to bring over. So let's bring those in too. So our first API, it's going to be a really simple one. It's just a get on weather forecast. And it's just going to return a list of, or an array of dynamic objects, which just mimic that JSON data that we get out of the box. There's nothing spectacular going on here. So it's going to get our data for us, but how do we have it in our site? Well, for that one, we need to change one line on fetch data, and that's this one. So that instead of getting it from that JSON application, we get it from weather forecast. The really cool thing about the static web apps is I can deploy this right now, and it will work, and I will be able to show you in Azure everything being spangly and awesome. But it doesn't work locally. And it doesn't work locally because the function and the website run on different ports. So for one thing, it doesn't know where to get the data from. And for another, you're getting the data between different URLs so that you have to enable cores. Now, that's the first one I'm going to show you, how we can do this locally, but still have it being deployed to production. And then I'm going to show you a better way. So what we're going to do, we're going to set something up inside of our client application so that when we run it locally, we can um, go to our own local function. But then when we deploy it into Azure, we go to the normal URL. So I'm just going to write a JSON file here, and we're going to call that app settings development JSON. And that's only going to have one setting in it. It's not going to be connection strings. So we don't care about that. It's just going to have API prefix. And this is pointing to that 7071, which is a default out of the box port for Azure functions. So we now know where to use it. But we still have this issue of cores, because we are going from one port number to another. The Azure function is going to refuse to run, so we need to turn that on too. So we're going to put one change inside of the API, and that's inside of this properties folder. We're going to add another JSON file. We're going to be looking at an amount of JSON files today. But at least it's not YAML. And this one is just going to have a launch profile so that when we run this from the browser, it's going to start it with cores enabled for just everything. But again, that's not going to go up to Azure. This is only when running locally. Last step that we need to do 
is make sure, of course, that when we start our application, we're running both of our projects because you can't make a call to a API which isn't running. Now, this is where the drum roll comes in. You go, please work. It started, it's building, come on, succeeded, this is good. We're getting the storage emulator. I'm seeing the Azure function window in front of me. I won't bore you with that. And we have an application. So what I want to show you is just if we go to the network, we have our count tab, and yes, I can increase the counter. Woohoo. And then we get the fetch data, and it's broken. Why are you broken? Well, this is always good fun. Interesting. You say you worked. Ah. I know what I've not done. I've missed a step. Sorry. Bad Stacy. We need to, of course, use this setting. I put it in there, but I skipped a step. So in order to use this setting, we're going to go into the program CS. Now, we have dependency injection for HTTP client out of the box when we make a Blazor web application. And all we're going to do is tweak this just a little tiny bit. So let me bring a new line across. <coughs> And what I've done is just added this step here, build a configuration, get me the API prefix, and if it doesn't exist, then just use the base address of the application. Fingers crossed it works better this time. What's a live demo without problems? Drum roll, and we have data, woo -hoo! And we can see if we look at the headers that this data is coming from that 7071. So for quite a while, this was how I had to run and debug my website locally when I was working on it. Then later on in the year, we got static web app CLI, the SWA CLI. And this is a much better way of running your static web applications locally. And it means that you don't need a lot of the boilerplate that I've just added to this project. So first of all, let's get rid of some boilerplate. So we don't want this app settings. We don't want that line that I forgot that has been in there for a whole 30 seconds can be removed now. Thank you. Uh, and we can also get rid of the launch settings inside of our API. So the static web app, let me bring a, a terminal window across. It replicates that environment that we have inside of uh, the Azure static web app. As said in my intro, there's proxying done inside of there so that your static web app and your Azure function look like they're on the same URL, even though they're not. And this command is going to do the same thing locally. You install the static web app via npm. Um, and with the start command, you can tell it where to look for the client application, localhost 5000, because I'm running a uh, .NET Core. You can tell it where the files are for the API, and it will run your API for you. You don't have to pre-run this. And the last option that I'm using is just a run command to do something at the time when we start the SWA. And that's just going to do the .NET watch run on my project in the client directory. Now, the SWA has so many more options. And that is a whole different talk. Uh, but I can really recommend looking into it if you are going to be playing with static web apps. So if we run this now, first of all, start up our .NET application. It should then start up our API. And in a second, come on, work for me. You work this afternoon, work for me now. There we go. We now have this URL that we can run locally. So if we open a web browser now, we can go to this IP address. We can open up our networking tools again. And if we go to fetch data here, what I want to show you is that it really is exactly the same URL as we have inside of our um, browser. So it just makes everything that much simpler for us. Um, right, so the 
thing we're going to do is actually push this up to Azure, and then while it's deploying, we are going to start building our brand. So let's come back into here. Let's make sure everything's saved before I do the git commit. And we've added our app. Push that up. Fingers crossed I've got a decent network connection, and it's gone. So this is my GitHub repo. And if I refresh this now, you see my API, my client, and the solution file. And this is what we're going to use to make that static web app. So inside the Azure portal, um, I've already created the resource group that I want to use for my demo. And there's already one static web app in here, which we'll be using if we have enough time later. I'm going to click, click, blah, click the Create button, if I can speak. And we're just going to look for static web app. Create that. Make sure that the subscription and resource group are good. And then we need to give it a name. So live demo, I always like. Really cool thing about static web apps, that name only has to be unique to your resource group, uh, as opposed to a standard uh, web app where it has to be unique to Azure. Um, this will get its own unique URL assigned to it during the creation process, which can make naming that little bit easier, even if it does make the URLs that little bit more interesting. Then we need to decide whether or not we want a free plan or a standard plan. For hobby sites, absolutely use the free plan. You get so much out of the box that you don't have to pay for. I believe you get two custom URLs. You get the authentication for GitHub and a couple of other services. I always use the GitHub one, so I've forgotten the rest. I will put them on Twitter later. Um, if you go for the standard, then you get uh, networking. You get five custom domains instead of two. And you get to add your own um, custom authentication and authorization as well. I'm going to use a free one for this. Uh, I'm not in the US. I'm in the Netherlands. So I'm going to be going for West Europe. And I want to get it from GitHub. And if you don't mind, I'm going to log into GitHub on a different screen. Now, I do know some people that hate this step. The fact that I'm authorizing the Azure portal to do something to my GitHub account, but it does good things, so I personally don't mind. So I want my organization. I want my Blazor Talk demo, and I want to deploy my main branch. So after we've told the Azure portal where our code is, we then have to give it some presets on what we want to build. And you can see here, it's, I'm doing this in Blazor, but you can also do it for Angular, for React, Svelte, Vue. Um, let's just pick the Blazor one for ease of access. And then you have to tell it where your code lives. And out of the box, client is in client and API is in API, which is why in my applications, I just keep it the same because it just makes life just that so much simpler until you do a typo and then it makes it so much more complex. The output location um, for Blazor, as long as it's not an existing folder, it will work. So I always just keep the default there. If you're doing Angular, it's a little bit more interesting. Um, but for Blazor, this works out of the box. So let's create this one. And the really cool thing about static web apps, they get created in seconds, literally. It's, uh, it's not one where you have to wait an age to, come on, mouse, do something. Whee! Bluetooth is really weird. So here is our static web app, and we have this awesome URL. We, uh, awesome. Thank you, Azure. I have issues saying Ws and Rs. So Witty Rock is a really interesting one for me. And here is our static web app live waiting for your content. So where is that content, and how is it going to get there? Well, if we come back to our GitHub repo, you can see we now have this workflows directory. And it's actually created a GitHub action for us that is going to, on a push to the main branch, do all of our building and deploying out of the box, which I also really liked because I'd not used GitHub actions until I started doing this. So it's awesome when somebody else does it for you. It means I can't make mistakes. 
and this is going to deploy it for us. It's also got some staging work in there so that when you make changes in a pull request, you get to preview what you're going to be putting live. And I'm going to come back to that later on in the talk. So that is the first step. We've created our static web app, but it's not much of a brand so far with it just being a scaffolded app. So what are our next steps? Well, the first one that we need to do is actually add some routing to our project. Because although you can't see it locally, because it's a static web app, because there's no hosting going on, nothing actually exists outside of your browser. Which means if you go to that counter page, your browser knows that counter page, but if you hit F5, the server goes, nope, never heard of that, and you get a 404. So we're going to need to fix that one and let it point us in the right direction. Now, a couple of years ago, I did this in a really complex, interesting way using the proxy inside of an Azure function to do all of this for me. It was a nightmare. I constantly had to keep certificates up to date. With static web apps, it's really easy. Inside of our www root folder, we're going to add yet another JSON file. I did say we're going to be doing lots of JSON files. And we're going to call that static web app config JSON. And as it, the name kind of suggests, this is where you can put your configuration for your static web app. Now, you can set up all of your routes in here. You can set up uh, authentication and authorization for your routes in here to make sure that you can only access the routes that you're allowed to access. Right now, though, we are just going to be really cheating and simple. And we're just going to put the navigation fallback in there. And that means that if you find something that you don't know, just go to index and let the Blazor routing take over, and that will deal with it. With this out of the box, we can now have that F5 functionality. You can do deep links to go deep into your site to a particular page when you're posting um, URLs online. And it just kind of works. So that is our routing. I'm not going to push that one up individually. Unfortunately, I can't demonstrate that one locally, because no matter how you run it locally, it works. But what we can do is actually start doing the cool stuff. Let's make this my own website. So number one, I want to change my index page, because I don't like this hello world, and I certainly don't want a survey to say how you're enjoying Blazor. So I'm just going to change that one to be a really simple building your own thing. And let's just say uh, Stacy Clouds Place. See how I did a like, typo there? This is why I've got code snippets. So that's going to give me a home page, which I'm slightly happier with than the default Blazor one. And then I need to do a little bit of cleanup. So I don't want this fetch data page, so let's delete that one. Yep. I don't want the counter page, so let's delete that one. And lastly, inside of our shared folder, we have this nav menu. Again, out of the box, you get navigation built in. But we've just deleted two pages, so we also need to make sure that we delete the navigation from here too. So that's cleaned it up a little bit. Now I need to actually get my own data in there. Now I said that I use dev.2 for my blog posts. And dev.2 has a really awesome API system where you don't even need to be logged in for some things. And one of the things that you don't need to be logged in for is to get a list of articles for a particular user. So with this, we're going to get a nice amount of JSON back, listing each one of my articles and allowing me to uh, yeah, get the metadata for that and make my own menu up. And this is what we're going to be using. So we're going to come back to our application. And we're going to find the right page. In order to get this data out of Dev.2 and into my site, I'm going to add a couple of models to my project. So the first thing I'm going to do is add a folder to keep everything just you know, that little bit neater. And the first one that I'm going to do is just a text post summary. And this one is going to be the model that I'm going to be passing from my API and to my Blazor site. So it's going to be really simple. I just want the ID, the URL of the blog, the title description, the cover image, 
and the date that it was published. Now I also need something to represent that blog post that I just showed you in that JSON file. Now this one is kind of similar and kind of not. So we're going to make a new object for this one. It's almost the same, only we have had these JSON properties so that we can read the right fields that we want to out of that big long JSON string and get the data that we need without passing too much between the back end and the front end and without tying my front end to my dev.2 and data source. I, I kind of like keeping that separate. Also means, of course, we're going to need an adapter to go between the two. Now, in real life, I would be using uh, AutoMap or something like that for this. But since as I was just playing around when I wrote this, I thought, you know what, I'll roll my own. And then for this demonstration, I thought the one that I've rolled is way too complex. I love it, but it's way too complex. Let's do a simpler one. So we're going to add an adapter. And this is going to take in that JSON input just as a string. It is going to deserialize that using the um, .NET JSON deserializer, uh, system.text.json. And it's going to make us a enumerable of the dev.2 posts. And then just for each one of those, we're going to make a standard post and then just return it. There's nothing overly complex in there. Last but not least, we need to put all this together into an actual Azure function so that we can get it to our front end. So let's add a new function. Call it blog posts. We want HTTP trigger again. And what this is going to do is spin up a new HTTP client. I should probably do dependency injection for this, but for a demo, I kind of live with it. We're going to be going to dev.2 and getting all of my blog posts. We are going to convert those into the format that we want, and then we're just going to send it out. So now we have the data available. We just need to read it into our client and make it available for our users to see. So next step is to get it into the front end. Now, first thing I'm going to do is make that model again. Now, this is a little bit of duplication. And in my real life website, I have an extra project that does this. It just shares it between the two. Uh, but that takes more time to spin up than just simply adding an extra class. So for the purpose of this demo, we're just going to be uh, cheating. So blog post summary, spot the deliberate mistake if you can. And here again, we're just having the ID, the blog URL, title, etc., so that we can now use it in the front end. And then we're just going to make a service, which is going to read that for us. Now, the cool thing about the service, it's also going to hold the state for us to make sure that we're not doing multiple calls to the back end and firing off the function more times than we really need to. So we're going to call that blog post summary service. And then we're going to bring some text over, and I'll go through with you what it's doing. So this blog post summary service, it has a HTTP client which is injected. That's the one that we saw in the program CS file earlier on. And it has one asynchronous task, um, function, load summaries. And what that does, it checks to see whether or not a public property called summaries is empty, or whether or not I really told it, no, I want you to load this. And if that's not null, then we just do that call to the back end and we store our data. If it, if it isn't null, then we do nothing, because we already have the data that we want. And then we just make this available to the outside world so that we can, set this, uh, we can see this where we want to. And where we want to see that is in a new page. So now we want to put these blog posts on the screen. I'm going to do this in a few different steps. So we're going to add a component to show an individual blog post. And we're going to add a page to list all of those blog posts on the screen. And because I like doing things in absolutely the wrong order, the first thing I'm going to do is add the page. 
So we want a new Razor component, not a new Razor page, a new Razor component. We want to call that blog posts. And then we're going to bring across some more code here. So we're going to have a service in this page, and we're going to check to see whether or not those summaries are null. If they're null, then we know we're still loading. We know we don't have anything back from our API yet, so we're just going to show a loading sign. Please don't die. Then if we do have summaries, then we're going to put them on the page. And for each one of them, we're going to be showing a blog post summary component so that our users can actually see what we're doing. Now, we see lots of red squiggles here, so we need to fix them. First one that we're going to fix is uh, we're going to add a code behind to this page so we can actually get access to our data. Now, inside the Blazor, if you add a new class and you call that the name of your razor file .razor .cs, then Visual Studio automatically puts it in the right place for you and keeps your code looking neat. I really like this. It works for CSS files too. Now, do I need a code behind? Yeah, it's kind of a personal choice. For simple stuff, I just use a code block that you can put into a Razor page. For more complex stuff, I put it behind, probably more because of my history than anything else. Do what works for you. The code behind that we're going to have is we're going to be injecting this blog post summary service. We're going to get that from dependency injection. We're going to add that in a second. And on initialized async, we're going to be calling that load summaries to actually get the data for us. And then once it's available, we're going to be able to use that in the front end. So let's get our data, of, or let's add our service to the um, DI first. If I can find what I'm looking for. We'll do it by hand. This is where you really see how badly I type when people are watching. So builder.services, and we want to add a no. We want to add a scoped service, and that needs to be a, oh, come on. You're not going to be nice to me, are you? Where's my services gone? I love it when things work for you. Thank you. So we're adding a scoped service for my blog post summary service so, so that we can use it inside of that page. Next, we need to add our component. So for that, again, because I know I'm going to be adding lots of components, I'm going to put a folder in there for components. And the first one that I'm going to create is going to be a new Razor component. And we're going to call that blog post summary component. Now, this one's really simple, so I'm not going to do a code behind. I'm just going to be adding a parameter. And then that parameter, I'm just going to put it on the screen. So if I come back to my blog posts now, we can see it's still broken. And it's still broken because I need to add a using statement. So using client.components. And when I do that and I put a semicolon, then I get the nice dark purple. It now knows what I'm trying to show on the screen. But I'm going to be using components in more places. So there's actually a better place to do this. So let's get rid of this. We have this underscore imports.razor. And this is used in each one of our Razor pages. So if I add my import statement here, in theory, everything should now work. So we're just going to add one more thing. And then we're going to try it out and see whether or not I've made mistakes. Now, one last thing is our navigation. We want to be able to get to our blog post list page. 
So we're going to add that in there. We're going to go back to our static web app CLI. Now, this may have worked, it may not. The fun thing about .NET 5 and the um, static web app CLI is sometimes it recompiles beautifully and everything works as it should do. And other times, it really does weird stuff to you. So let's get my, come on, which screen? You know what? I'm just going to rerun it because it's the easiest way to get the URL as well. What? Okay, that's just not fun. Okay, let's see whatever this has got then. What have I done wrong? Nothing. Come on, you can't succeed inside of Visual Studio but fail at the command line. That's just not playing fair. Thank you. New laptop, newly reinstalled, and it doesn't have autosave on it yet. Give that person a prize. So we have our nice new front end. We have our blog post. Our blog post load. Yes, I did something right. And I just put something in there so that when I clicked on it, I could go out to my Dev.2 site and I could actually see the blog post that I wanted to see. This was literally my first iteration of my website. This was my first step into building that online brand. It doesn't look spectacular, but you know what? It worked. Now, before we push this up to Azure, there's one last thing that I want to do. And that is, if I have everything already in that uh, service for the blog posts, then why not use it on my index page so I can always show the latest thing that I've worked on when you come to that home page. And because of how this is built up, that's really not a hard thing to do. So we're going to add a code behind to our index. And I am going to remember to save it this time. And what we're going to do here, we're injecting that blog post summary service again. We uh, have an individual summary, which we're holding privately. And then we have a public property that we can only get. And what that's going to do is, if the summary isn't null, we're going to return it. If the summary is null, then we're going to call a function and get one. And that's this function at the bottom. So what we're going to do is, when we have summaries, order them descending by that published at date, so I always get the latest blog post, and just take the first one. And in doing this, if this works, did that build, that built. If I go to home and refresh my page, we should now get nothing, because I've not added the razor page yet. We need to change this one too, of course, in order to use it. I need to add a new section here, so that if I have, again, if the summaries are null in that service, we just display loading. And if not, we actually display the blog posts. And if it's not null and I still don't have a blog post, then you know what? I don't have any blog posts to display, and I'm sad. So now, we should be able to go to here and refresh. And there we go. You get my latest blog post on the front end. Not looking amazing, but you know what? It's there. So. I just want to push this up to GitHub uh, so I can show you inside of Azure. And then there's a couple of other things I want to show you which will just make doing this a little bit easier. Add dev.2. Let's push that up. Commit all and push. So while that's, yes, pull then push. You have to pull then push because, of course, it's got the workflow added to it. So while that's rebuilding, if we go back to our Azure Static Web App, our witty rock, hey, I said it. We now get that first Hello World thing that I was telling you about. We get the fetch data. 
And if we press the right keys, we should be able to see that we get that weather forecast and we're getting it from that same witty rock. Just like I was saying at the start, this is all uh, proxied so it works for you. The bit that's not going to work, of course, is if I hit F5, we get that 404 not found. This is why we added that uh, navigation fallback into our application. Whilst it was there, I just wanted to show it you're working. So with any luck, I should have an action running. So that's for the one that we've just built. So the last two things that I want to show you are the workflow for when you make changes and you want to see them really inside of Azure because running on SWA is awesome and it really does make that developer in a loop so much better. Seeing it running in Azure is always a really nice one because it's not always the same as running it locally. So I have a different application here, Blazor um, Workflow Demo, and I have an open pull request. And if we go in, into this pull request, um, I've made one change to a file. And when I made the pull request, it has spun up a new environment inside our, that static web app. And it's given me a URL to it. So if I open this in a new window, when you make a pull request, you get a new environment with this added to your internal URL dash and then your pull request number. So first pull request, number one. And then the zone that you're running your web app in. And that's to differentiate it from your production site. And what I want to show you is if I go into weather forecast, we have, oh, the weather outside is frightful because I wrote this demo when it was snowing and not when it was summer. And I thought, well, that's like a nicer way of having just the boring text on the screen. If we go to the standard one, just so I can show you the difference, if I get rid of that and go to fetch data, this component demonstrates fetching data from the server. It's kind of a more useful sentence, but nowhere near as fun. And like I say, this is out of the box when you create a static web app. So you can make a pull request. You can check your things running in a production-like environment. You can see if you have issues, and this has been awesome when I was playing with .NET 6 because some things work so amazingly locally and really, really, really not when I pushed it up to Azure. Um, there's one huge, huge proviso for the um, pull requests, and that is this is open to the world. So it's unfortunate, but if what you're doing, if it absolutely cannot be visible to the outside world, then you can't use this functionality, unfortunately. You've always got to keep that in the back of your mind when you're running this. Uh, what is nice is when I complete my pull request, it's going to clean everything up for me, uh, which is, yeah, I don't have to do any cleaning up. It's all out of the box. And so it's, when you're doing a hobby thing, it makes it nice. And for work, it's also going to be quite nice. Um, the last one for this workflow is the difference between free accounts and paid accounts. I believe you have one or two staging environments for a free account, and you have many more for a standard app. So again, if you know that you're going to be having lots of pull requests open at the same time, you want lots of environments, and you're going to need to go for that standard web app, which means you're going to have to pay, and I believe it's the whopping sum of about seven euros a month. It's stupidly expensive. Um, it's, yeah, it's quite nice. Last thing that I want to show you before I finish is the custom domain. We have the wit really, I've had yellow oceans, I've had beautiful names, and then you give me witty walk when I've got to stand in front of people. Not only is that not good for my online brand, because I can't even say it, let alone tell other people what it is, having people remember dash 018C65503 is not great. I want to give them my own domain name. Thankfully, we can do that. So if we go into my multi-purpose PR static app, I'm going to quickly add a custom domain here to show you uh, it working. And then I'm going to go through a second time to go through the steps. 
So we need to add, and I want to add www.stacyclouds.com, I believe is the one that I set up. Let's add that. Yeah, that one looks like it might work. Now, what did I just do? Well, when you're doing a domain, you need to actually give the domain that you want to go to. So the one that I did was stacyclouds.com. The point when I was writing this demo, I was really pleased I brought three domain names because it made life a whole lot easier. Then you have to pick whether or not you want to do a C name or a text record. And this is why I use this preset one, because setting this up can take time to propagate through the internet. It's not one that I want to do in the middle of a demo. And when you set this up, um, Azure is going to do a check for you before it tries to create it. So if I add this one now, hopefully it should come back with an error really quickly. No, it won't because I'm already adding this one. Ah. OK. Yeah, discard that. Let's try this one in the different one. Let's go back to the live demo because this one's definitely not got anything set up. Third time lucky. StacyClouds.com. So if I try and add this one here where it's not set up for it, I instantly get back an error message telling me this one's already being used by something else. Clean it up or don't use it. You get quite a reasonable error message back. You can also have a different error message. And that is, if you don't have any C name set up whatsoever, then you just get one. Yeah, C name is invalid. Please and come back. And the first time I did this, it was a little bit interesting at my domain provider, and it took me an afternoon waiting for things to propagate time and time again. So this is how we can add our custom domains. And I hope I have time to show you that working, because they can sometimes take a little bit of time to come through. Yeah, that one's still adding. Can we at least show you a working application in production? Here we have, I now have my Stacy Clouds place. We have my first blog post. When we go to blog post, we can see everything in my production environment. And then we can go off and read what we want to read from the list. This is my first step in doing this. The next step was to add a different facet of my life to my uh, website. So I added my image um, blogs that I have, and then actually made changes so that I could read the blogs on my own website. I've not quite got that one working as I want yet. Uh, when you do that, do remember to set the canonical names in your origins, because otherwise you've got duplicate content, and Google really doesn't like that. But by doing a few hours every now and then, I managed to get to a kind of nicer looking website. This is still using that same Blazor scaffolded application. The only thing I've changed here, plus minus, is the CSS to make navigation links do what they want to do, where I can have my list of blog posts. I can load the blog posts, and I can read them on my own page. I can show my pictures when they eventually load. And just because I wanted to play with it, I even added the authentication. And this really is so quick to add. So I'm now authenticated as me. When you set this up, you can add a role-based access to your application to make sure you can only do the things that you need to do. It's all out of the box. I'm going to put a link to all of this on Twitter um, after I finish, so that if you want to try it yourself, you can try it yourself. Last one, is this loaded? Come on, let me, let me do the custom domain. Thank you. So just to finish off, because it's nice when you can actually have all of your demos eventually working. There we have stacyclouds.com, the app that we've just created in about 40 odd minutes, live in production. So, like I say, 45 minutes, we have created a website, we've got our data from the external website, we've deployed to a production environment, which I really love, with a custom domain. 
Um, we've had a very brief look at the workflow that's available for us when you create this out of the box and just had a quick look at how we can run it locally on our machine so that we can keep our inner loops as short as possible. We started to build that band, brand one step at a time without eating the elephant and still using existing resources. I love Dev.2, I'm not leaving there, but it's nice that I can actually put this into my own personal place. If you want to give this a try, uh, there was a QR code. I'm going to put the link on Twitter um, after we're done as well. And that goes to MS Learn and takes you through the steps. If you're not interested in static web apps, still go to MS Learn because it is full of absolutely awesome stuff. Uh, well, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you for your patience when everything went absolutely interesting at the start. It has been awesome to stand in front of people. Cheers. Stacey, thank you so much for kicking off the first hybrid in-person event we have since uh, all broke loose, let's uh, say it like that. Yeah, that was interesting last <laughs> year. And uh, really, thank you for having me. This is, uh, e even with all of the fun, this, is, uh, this has been awesome. I really enjoyed it. It was perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a couple of questions written down, but I wanted to give people in the audience the, uh, the chance to ask a question if you have any. And otherwise, I've jotted some down. So <laughs> let me go through these. Yeah, so you, you might have answered it a little bit right at the end, but you said uh, at the beginning that uh, there are some authentication options that are enabled out of the box. Yeah. I think we saw three at the end. Yeah, that's the three that you get out of the box. So is there more you can enable, and is it easy to plug those in? Um, I've honestly not tried yet. It's... In order to use different ones to this, you have to go to that paid account and you have to roll your own. Uh, the fun one with these three, it, it's literally just built in. It's, uh, you just go to a link included in your website um, inside that static web app and it does it for you. Okay, thanks. So, um, yeah, about the live pull request previews yeah. that we saw. So if you have any external dependencies like some database running in the cloud or, or somewhere, uh, would that still work? Is there any help you get when setting that up? Um, honestly, I don't know. I've not tried that one. It's, um, it does just spin it up with your um, files that go to production. So I think possibly not. I think it's just going to spin up your website and your API. And if that's pointing to... Uh, whichever environment, that's what it's going to be. But this is also the really limited out-of-the-box base experience. <coughs> Excuse me. It's a little bit dry when you've been talking for an hour. Um, obviously, in a real-world situation, you're going to have a much more complex flow, and you're going to be able to set those environment variables that you need to set. And inside of the portal, you can do that really easily, of course. You can say, I've got staging environment and staging points to XYZ. I've got production that points to XYZ. That's no different to other Azure environments. Okay, so probably with a little customization. Yeah, it's that. not going to be out of the box, but you are going to be able to do it. Cool. And the last one uh, I had is, <coughs> is there any uh, point uh, where you were working on this where you thought I might have to step up to a regular app service or some other? Um, no. The, the things that I've been using so far, I've not come across any of the limitations in what I need. We're looking into this at work at the moment for some things for possibly using next year that will be on a paid for version because that's got way more complex stuff. But, uh, but certainly for a hobby site, if, if you don't need networking, if you don't need um, all of the different custom domains, then you can keep it quite simple. So if you're looking at it, uh, for work, that also means you're, you want to use Blazor over there as well. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I want to use Blazor. I'm sorry to my Angular colleagues, but I want to use Blazor. Okay. Well, those are the questions I had. So, again, I want to thank you very much for being our first speaker tonight. And uh, for everybody here, we'll take a short break, 10 to 15 minutes, and then we'll be back with our second session. We'll see you back then. Awesome. Thank you very much.